Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar of Wetsus entitled Natural Nanoparticles in Water, the key to new technologies. My name is Elmer Fuchs. I am program manager at Wetsus in Leeuwarden, and I will be hosting this session together with Prof uh, Professor Hermann Offerhaus here, which will be my co-host. And uh, without further ado, I would like to ask our first speaker, Professor Dennis Gebauer from the University of Hanover to start giving us a nice overview about natural nano associates called dollops in water. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Emma, for the nice introduction. Just struggling to get my presentation started, even though we practice it. I hope everybody can hear me okay. And I'm very happy to give you an overview and the background behind dollops. And as Emma mentioned already, these dollops are naturally occurring nanoparticles, which play a key role in yeah, new technologies. And we talk about, especially in this context, about magnetic water treatment. So here it was proposed that these dollops may explain effects that magnetic fields have on precipitation of calcium carbonate. So um, in my introduction and background, I will mostly focus on the calcium carbonate system, although these dollops seem to have a yeah, broader general relevance uh, for precipitation from aqueous solutions. So you may ask yourself, why deal with calcium carbonate? <clears throat> it's a pretty boring system. So it's chalk or limestone and uh, maybe not the most uh, exciting chemical compound to deal with, but I beg to differ. It's a very interesting material. It's actually the most abundant biomineral forming these fascinating structures that yeah, living organisms use to pr uh, protect themselves from predators uh, or something like that. So if you walk on the beach, um, depending on the beach, when there are many mussels, you essentially walk on calcium carbonate. And also calcium carbonate has a great industrial importance. So it's used, for example, as the major ingredient to cement, and thereby it's probably one of the most used materials by the humankind, but it's also important as a filler, as a pigment, uh, and so forth. So there are vast applications of calcium carbonate. And what I mentioned before already, when it comes to magnetic water treatment, what we want to achieve with this is of course, to prevent calcium carbonate formation. So sometimes of course, calcium carbonate formation is not wanted as in these applications or in nature, but you would want to avoid it and um, yeah, to, to uh, save your machine or your laundry from getting damaged. Um, also, like from a scientific point of view, um, calcium carbonate is a pretty nice model system to study because the bonds that are relevant here between calcium ions and carbonate ions are almost purely ionic in character, which makes it easy. However, it's still enough complicated, so to speak. So it has uh, in the crystalline state where you have three dimensional periodic order, different structures, that means different polymorphs, um, partly anhydrous, partly hydrous, but there are also different amorphous forms. Amorphous forms means they don't have a long range structure, but there can be different short range structures uh, in these amorphous forms. So it's very exciting to study how this can be controlled and directed. And last but not least, calcium carbonate also binds carbon dioxide chemically and thereby it participates yeah, in meta cycles that are relevant uh, for our climate. So coming back to the example of water hardness and the magnetic water treatment, um, it's important to understand how calcium carbonate forms. Of course, that's directly evident, but also when we want to understand how biominerals are formed, of course, like the birth of the particles is the most important step. And there are several expectations that we can have um, for nucleation theories to be uh, deliverable, so to speak. And the one, one important question is when calcium carbonate can actually form? When is it allowed to form a crystal of calcium carbonate? And that's uh, the subject of thermodynamics. Then we want to understand what determines the structure of the material. That means the different polymorphs. 
for calcium carbonate, it may not be directly evident, but structure can be a very important contribution to materials properties. And the prime example is carbon. So if you compare graphite and diamond, it's chemically the same, but it behaves very different. And this is only due to the structure. So it's very important to understand how you can, how you can control and direct this. Then there's the question, what are the earliest precursors? Do we really start from single ions? Is there something different in the solution? What are their properties? Are there intermediates, so to speak, amorphous intermediates on the way to crystals? What's the speed of all of this, the kinetics, how fast does it occur on which time scales, and how can yeah, these processes, for example, influence particle shape and size, which is also uh, important in terms of magnetic water treatment. And this list goes on and on and on. And of course, one overarching important question is how we can control all of this or any part of this that we are interested in. For example, avoiding precipitation or uh, promoting it to be able to remove, for example, calcium carbonate. And this should, of course, also be included in a good scientific theory to explain all of this. So I want to introduce a sort of cartoon language to try to deal with this rather complex question. So we ask ourselves, how do we come from a calcium carbonate solution? So we have single calcium and carbonate ions in the solution. Yeah, I'm not showing the water, the circuits are the ions. Uh, however you prefer, you can think of this as calcium and this of carbonate or the other way around, it doesn't matter. And then the question is, of course, we will start with a very small particle. And as I've shown it here, it could be crystalline. And then the question is how this then develops or grows into a calcium carbonate macrocrystal, which I just depicted with this um, square in two dimensions because it's difficult to show this in three dimensions here. So there are many question marks and you can actually think about a variety of different uh, alternative pathways to how to yeah, connect these stages. For example, there could be an amorphous stage. So, this first nuclei, they don't, are not necessarily ordered and crystalline, but have no certain order and are amorphous. And it's actually uh, at small size, very likely that amorphous is more stable than crystalline. Also later, you could have growth just by particles. So you attach very small nanoparticles to grow a macrocrystal rather than iron bar iron growth of your small nanocrystal or anything in between. Uh, or different. So there's really a complex um, yeah, landscape of processes that are possible and it depends what can really be done and how fast it is. And this is of course also important for uh, generating such complex structures like muscle shells because this is 95% calcium carbonate but looks very different from the scale that forms at your faucet for example at your uh, water. So it can be controlled. That's what nature teaches us. And you may open your textbook and tackle it from the point of view of classical nucleation theory. So this is a very established old theory um, that has dominated our understanding of what nucleation is for a long time, more than a century. And it's actually based on ideas of one of the fathers of thermodynamics of uh, Gibbs. And this is also actually the name of the free energy, the G that I'm going to show you later. And there have been some refinements and uh, reformulations by German and Russian uh, yeah, chemists, and they have uh, phrased this theory. And I would like to illustrate to you how it works. So going back to our cartoon language, that's where we start. We have the homogeneous solution of the ions and we have to get to the final particle somehow. And classical nucleation theory takes the simple approach. So we just assume that we have collisions based on diffusion in the solution between the ions and there's just the random creation of such small aggregates, which are nuclei that are the first germs, so to speak, uh, for, the, for the crystal formation. So, and that's a big oversimplification of classical nucle nucleation theory. We now also assume that these small nuclei behave as if they were macroscopic. This is an oversimplification because, of course, nanochemistry tells us nanoparticles are so interesting because they are dominated by surface and behave completely different. So um, this may be one reason why this theory maybe is not so powerful. I just wanted uh, to mention it at this point. And 
you have to realize that for these small nuclei, there's actually a lot of surface. And I mentioned this already, and I plotted this in this diagram. So we have here the total number of ions in the nucleus uh, over under this percentage of surface ions. And you see here, it's essentially for a very small nucleus, 100% surface. And if you again plot sort of in a little bit different view in two dimensions, such a small nucleus, I want to highlight what this means from an energetic perspective. So in the bulk, we have the so-called cohesive energy. So these are calcium and carbonate ions plus and minus attract each other. And there's force, which is this arrow. This particle here in the center is very happy because uh, if you sum up the forces, there's a net zero force, which sums up to the cohesive energy of the particle. However, if you go to the surface of the nucleus, then you only have interactions in these directions. And this sums up to a surface tension. And this is, in essence, an excess surface standard free energy, which is in a, well, thermodynamically not good. And you see, when you vary the size of the, of the nuclei, then the surface fraction will become less and less. That means there will be a critical size at which sort of you start to balance these surface costs. And that's the transition state in classical nucleation theory. And then you just grow iron by iron. And the theory tells us that you can only influence this barrier, this excess free energy, by supersaturation and um, yeah, interfacial tension. So you can introduce surfaces um, to try to decrease this barrier and thereby play with the rate of nucleation. And also, the thermodynamics behind it stipulates that these species are very rare. So you should not be able to detect any in solution. There should be only uh, ions, and once the supersaturation is high, enough, particles pop up randomly in time and space. So you may say this is too much for me. What is this delta G? What is free energy? What is this complex equation about? And I would like to convince you that it's very easy to understand. We can just make up an analogy with potential energy and real landscapes. So in chemistry and in nucleation in general, we have to think about free energy landscapes, which we can understand completely in analogy to potential energy and here water. So what I've shown here is a picture of the mountains, the Alps maybe, and we take the water here as a calcium carbonate solution, it probably is, and it had diff has different states. And in terms of potential energy, the height, this is an unstable state. If you look somehow in the distance, here's a metastable state, and maybe a thousand kilometers away or so is the sea, and there the water is in a stable state. So thermodynamics is this valley. It tells us what is possible. And possible is only to go down in gravity. So we have a spontaneous pathway without any barriers for this little creek or river that is uh, formed here uh, in this landscape. So if we want to do chemistry in this state that's unstable, we can do that by just introducing a kinetic stabilization and kinetics is the mountains in this energy landscape. So we make a little dam here, then the water will not drain and we can do all kinds of reactions uh, in this state. If you think now about crystals, then we have to go to another valley because we know that crystals do not form spontaneously, but rather there's a large barrier. So in our cartoon, the crystal is at the bottom of a lower valley over that mountain. And the critical nucleus is actually on top of the mountain. So here's our transition state that has to be overcome to be able to yield this macroscopic crystal from the solution from the lake that is here. And in this picture, also pumping up the water from the sea to this sea level is the increasing of supersaturation. Thereby, you get closer and closer to the transition state, and you eventually this facilitate nucleation. However, um, you still need a picture for the metastable fluctuations. And this is yourself carrying a bucket of water over that mountaintop. And this is also like reflecting the thermodynamics of it compared to the yeah, number of water molecules in the lake here and in your bucket, this is a very minor fraction. And there will be only very seldomly water molecules on top and you can almost not detect it. And of course, the height of the barrier here determines the rate because once you're up here, you can just pour your bucket down here and fill uh, yeah, the crystal, so to speak. So 
So, is there an alternative pathway? That's a good question. It depends on the landscape, of course. So um, you could go around here, but let's consider that um, at this moment, here's actually a tunnel. And that's an alternative pathway then, of course, to go beyond the mountain to the crystal by avoiding this critical nucleus. So it doesn't have anything to do with it. And still, it will not be spontaneous because you have to pump up the water to this lake to reach the, uh, the tunnel in the first place. And that's actually the, the idea of free energy landscapes and different reaction paths that you can yeah, try to influence also. And in the scheme, it looks like this. So you start with your homogeneous solution and then you have ion association in the system which yields thermodynamically stable clusters and that's not the problem of phase separation initially. You also see like if you think in terms of this surface tension, there's no surface here, there's only cohesive energy in the same phase. And then here, the phase separation is not based on the size, but on the dynamics of the species that are forming. So at some point, you can have chemical changes in the clusters here, higher coordination, which reduces the dynamics. So here, the dynamics are similar to the solution and not anymore. Thereby, you have an interface. An interface costs free energy, as I explained to you. And this will drive aggregation into nano, yeah, of these nano droplets into larger liquid intermediates which will then solidify and later crystallize and uh, yield crystals. Okay, I've just shown here the initial work where we discovered and described the crystal and it's now more than 10 years of work to formulate this mechanism based on various works, which you can read up in these review articles. And I mentioned before that in classical nucleation, you have mostly supersaturation and surface. So surface, uh, surface tension to play with to influence the process. And here you have various different possible controls. For example, if you protonate uh, terminal carbonate ions here, you can understand why maybe magnetic fields influence this transition and trigger it or even inhibit it depending on the conditions. So just to get back to the movie that I showed you initially, so this is a molecular dynamic simulation or a movie of a simulation. The water molecules are again not shown because you wouldn't be able to see anything. The triangles or these species here are the uh, carbonate ions, so carbon, three car uh, oxygens. This is a calcium. This is not here a bond, but the contact distance. So we have only ion pairs here. And if you start the movie, you will see that these ion associates will form a very dynamic chain. And that's the structural form of these prenucleation clusters, which we call the dynamically ordered liquid-like oxyanion polymer. And that's the clue behind this pathway. So this gives us a nice agreement with the exp experimental thermodynamics that we determine and also the coordination for these clusters. And it also gives an explanation why there's no spontaneous phase separation from these stable ion associates. Because if you try to condense it, and again here you have a mountain, a barrier, if you try to condense it towards a small bulk light size, it goes up because it doesn't want to spontaneously dehydrate at this point. So the question then is how do we have phase separation from these species? This was addressed in a different work, which suggested this uh, submerged liquid-liquid miscibility gap. I won't go into detail here. This is also more for the experts. Is essentially the process that I showed already that with increasing supersaturation, so here's the solubility limit here, you have a stable solution of calcium carbonate here, it becomes metastable, then you will get into a gap where the mixing occurs based on this changes in dynamics. And very recently, based on this model, we proposed yeah, a quantitative description of the liquid-liquid coexistence, which we could experimentally verify. And you see here different structures of amorphous calcium carbonates and different regions. And again, this is just maybe a teaser for the experts to go and look up. So summing up, we have introduced a new quantitative non-classical theory of phase separation based on these prenucleation clusters, which are stable species. And we can explain various things that were previously not possible with classical nucleation theory, the amorphous polymorphism I just mentioned, this liquid-liquid coexistence region, which we also experimentally verified. And more importantly, you can have very complex com control patterns over precipitation 
based on this model. And you have also possibility to explain uh, magnetic field effects. And it may be much more general and broader relevant than for calcium carbonate. So there have been works now published that similar things occur for iron oxide, calcium phosphates, for example, which are the main components of our teeth and bones, but also small organic molecules. And we think the reason is that in this ion association or association of solutes, it's not so much about the chemistry of the molecular monomers, it's more about the chemistry of water. So water plays the key role in all stages of this non-classical nucleation process, yielding dollops, which are yeah, the main natural nanoparticles, so to speak, playing the role here. So I would like to thank many people, collaborators and co-workers. I won't read the names for the sake of time, of course, also the funding agencies. Uh, I would like to thank Vetsus and Elmer for inviting me and of course you for your kind attention. Thank you. Well, Dennis, uh, thank you very much for your uh, interesting presentation. I'm looking at uh, Herman. Are there any questions? Not yet, not yet. Um, I do have one myself. Please. Um, I'm, I was triggered by the, the last remark that really a lot of it is about um, the, the, the water. So what is it about water that makes water so special that this kind of pre-nucleation happens? Is there one particular quality about water that makes it stand out? Well, I mean, there's, you, you know, there are many anomalies of water, which are due to, well, it's always difficult to simplify, of course, but one main reason is like the strange shape of the molecule, which is anisotropic. Yep. and then the dipole moment. So this leads to the fact that water strongly orders itself around solutes, and it also has the potential for various different structures due to the geometry of the molecule in the bulk and also for ice and so forth. So there's a whole zoo of different structures that control the thermodynamics and then also the kinetics of the processes that are going on. And it seems as though in aqueous solution, the interactions with the solutes are dominated by the structure of water. And that seems to be the key here, yes. There's, there's one more question here. Please. Um, could you please comment on the following? In systems where scaling is of concern, nucleation is heterogeneous. In other words, on surfaces. Um, can you comment on this? Yeah, it's absolutely true. So, I, I mean, that's also what classical nucleation theory suggests. And I'm, I'm not saying here it's in any term wrong or so. Um, it's just that, that surfaces will reduce the barriers uh, for phase separation and thereby precipitation can occur on surfaces. But also, of course, these pre-nucleation clusters can be influenced by surfaces in similar manner or in obvious manner. So um, there's, of course, uh, when I showed this various different possible paths of control in the dollop or pre-nucleation cluster pathway, also surfaces can have roles in influencing uh, this pathway. We have time for one more? We have time for one last question. Then we have a question here that says, if it is the hydration that rules the pre-nucleation, what about small organic molecules that are partially hydrophobic? Well, when they are partially hydrophobic, it's of course a bit more of a yeah, complex. complex situation because you may look at them as partly amphiphiles, where of course you have also like micellization or phenomena like that going on. But in general, like you have similar phenomena. The problem is of course, if it gets too hydrophobic, there will be no solubility or no sufficient solubility anymore. And you can't really have like a solution of your organic molecules anymore. So of course it's a balance, but it can get more complex, of course, uh, when it goes into the direction of amphiphiles or amphiphilic structures. Well, thank you, Dennis, uh, very much for your presentation, for answering the questions. And uh, unfortunately, due to the time, we cannot have any more questions on the topic at the moment. And uh, but we'll put them in the chat and yes. maybe. Uh, uh, you can have, I think you can see them as well, right? So maybe we can have a conversation there. Exactly.
Well, Dennis, thank you very much again for your contribution. And without further ado, I would like to ask our next speaker, Professor Luton Agostinho from NHL Standen, to tell us a little bit about nanoparticles in water other than dollops. And also dollops, of course. Sure. Well, thank you, Emma. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, well, uh, as, as informed, I will just give a general overview and a background about the, the nanoparticles in water, because for us, uh, as a water institute, is one of the topics that, uh, well, let's say, put us together on the table today. So the overview, a very quick overview, is that uh, I will try to give a short description of how we see this as water technologists, how we see these nanoparticles. Uh, I go a little bit over some challenges or, or let's say definitions of the geometry, the type and the fate. I give some ideas of what the literature is uh, giving uh, is reporting about this, these particles nowadays, the challenges, and then some take-home messages. So, well, if we go to the first part, so, um, of course, this is a simplified way to put it. So, given the audience today, I try to keep it as simple as possible in this, in this sense. So, if you would think about which kind of, how can we define nanoparticles in water, we could just say that there are suspended materials with nanometric dimensions. Uh, and I, yeah, I underline suspended because in, in water technology, we really, uh, from the definition, from the basis, we want to, to differentiate what is suspended and what is dissolved. Uh, and in suspended, even you say, okay, we use turbidity as a method to define suspended materials. And uh, for example, we use color as a way to define uh, dissolved materials. But when you go that down in the sizes, even the very definition of what's suspended and, and dissolved this becomes to be an interesting aspect. Eh? So let's just assume that these nanoparticles in water are suspended materials with nanometric dimensions. And then we, of course, have to quickly go to the dimension. So a nanometric particle will be a particle which is one billion times uh, smaller than a meter. So if you get a meter as a reference at the average of a four years old kid, a nanometric particle will be one billion times smaller than that. And you see also that when we go to that size, you are not very far away from even the water molecule size, which is just 10 times smaller. So you start to see the difficulties of or difficulties we have to classify, quantify, and qualify these particles, because then you are almost uh, defining methods that could also quantify and qualify molecules. Eh? Uh, you also think, if you also think about the shape, it's also sometimes a, a challenge. So in the left side, we have a, a picture of nanofibers that we also do here in our lab. Uh, and the right side, we have nanospherical particles in this, this nanometric size. So in the left side, what is interesting is that these fibers, these are nylon six uh, fibers, polymeric fibers. You see that they are nanometric in diameter, but they are actually not in the length. So when you talk about the shape, you also sometimes have the challenges of classify a nanoparticle because you have to define a specific dimension. Also, you have to see that when you get a water sample and you try to quantify, qualify the particles, suspended particles, you never, never get a single size. You get a, a polytude of size. You get a distribution, as we say. Yeah? Uh, so uh, in this distribution, how can you define that you have indeed nanometric uh, uh, particles? So yeah, if we go to the European Commission uh, definition, you have to say that your population, 50% of your population has to be in the range of one to 100 nanometers. So just to give you an idea about the populations. So when we talk about the type and the fate, this is also, of course, a very simple way to see it, but based basically on the literature. So if you go to the literature and you try to find material about nanoparticles in water, basically you have groups uh, investigating metal oxides. Uh, actually, that, that was the most of the papers you see because of the quantity of the particles, uh, which are, uh, let's say, manufactured in the IT industry and other industries. I would say that the, the biggest part of the literature you'll find about identification of this type of particles. We have also lately, I will show another slide, lately a lot of 
interest in the, the polymeric nanoparticles, which are the, the nano and the microplastics. Uh, if you go to uh, below one micrometers, then nanoparticles as well. And of course, uh, the, this, this other colloids, because I'm also saying, well, the metal oxide to a certain extent can be considered as colloids as well. But then you have biomaterials and minerals, which will be more or less in the class of the dollops that Dennis has just mentioned. Eh? When you go to Feta, this is a very nice uh, picture that you can see everywhere these particles can be present in the air, in the water, in the river, you know, this is, but of course, this is a picture which was more prepared for the, for the plastic ones, for the polymeric ones, but it's just to show you that the Feta, they can come from many different materials and they can go everywhere. In our case, uh, being a water institute, we are really interested in particles that are in the water phase. Eh? But our many groups also look into particles, these nanoplastics or nano minerals in atmosphere, for example. Um, well, when we go a little bit more to what you find in the literature and what are the current challenges, so we can complete this overview. Uh, well, if you see the literature, as I said, you can find many different things. Eh? You find uh, the group of Professor Balusha in the States that are really uh, working on environmental samples, you see the group of the group of uh, um, of Cabrero that is you see in the in the plastic in the platinum oxides or the metal oxides part goes. Uh, we have also a lot in the in, in nanoplastics, and you have also you start to see in the last five years uh, also researchers really investigating this possibility of, of uh, remove them and identify them in natural waters. Uh, a very nice a very nice way to see uh, how important these particles they, they became to the water technology field is this plot where you can see uh, from the last 10 years the number of publications uh, addressing the nanoparticles in water has yeah, uh, increased from few publications per year to more than than 20, 25 publications. So it's a growth of more than five, five times. Um, and you see that the main focus are on the toxicol aspect, the toxicology aspect, the removal aspect, and the remediation aspect of these particles. Huh? And if you also look a little bit, you see that there are uh, groups uh, identifying or trying to identify these particles in fresh water, in drinking water, and also focusing on removal and water treatment systems. Why this is uh, a challenge or why this is important for us as water technologists, because as I mentioned, there is a toxic aspect. So there are many discu discussions about um, what are the concentrations, the toxic concentrations, the accumulations, where you can find them. Eh? So a group which is very, uh, 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 very much busy with this kind of, uh, of aspect is the group of uh, Professor Koeman in, ba in uh, Wageningen University. Uh, you can see in the picture that you, you, we have already find, uh, found particles, uh, polymeric nanoparticles in mussels, uh, for example. We have the, the analytical challenge because, I mean, as I explained in the beginning, the size of these particles, they are close to the molecular size. So analytically, it's, it's still quite a challenge to, to properly identify them, not only because of the size, but because, of course, also uh, the laborious work, which is to remove them for from very big uh, mixtures, or for example, if you get a sample from wastewater treatment plant, how can we properly uh, separate these particles from all the other particles that you find there? So the preparation of the samples, and the last one is of course the aspect of of how can we uh, properly remove them, uh, or even if we have to remove them to a, we, to a certain extent, which is directly linked to the toxicology side, and also directly linked to the analytical side, because if you want to see if you remove them, you have to be able to identify them. Uh, you have to be able to see them. Uh, just to give you some very uh, quick idea about the challenge in the analytic uh, and analytics, uh, basically you can say that the technologies that we have now, they both focus on the size determination or the focus on the chemical identification. So there are not many techniques that can combine these both things uh, that can tell you, hey, uh, in a sample, you have a population of uh, 100 nanometers uh, particles, and these particles are this type of metal and 200 nanometers, and these particles are this type. So to combine this, there are not many 
options analytically, and one of them is uh, the same system that you use at Wetsus, which is the uh, the FFF system, which is basically in very simple terms uh, a hydrodynamic way or a small cell where you can separate these particles hydrodynamically, and then followed by a, a multi-angle laser scattering device, meaning a laser type of device that can give you size, and then the same population after separated and then after measure the size, you can directly introduce them in, for example, an ICP-MS to couple the size with a specific element. Lastly, uh, if you have all these problems tackled, the size, uh, the, the, the toxicology aspect and the analytical aspect, why we are doing this? So I would say the main point is to understand more about this part because to be able to build uh, directives. Uh, so we know, for example, as I said before, if we really have to remove them, and if you have to remove them to each extent, and to each extent the concentration becomes to be critical. So in this in this plot, you see also quickly that we still lack a lot of legislation uh, to to tell us about that. Okay. Um, therefore, uh, getting build this knowledge, you will be able. To, we will be able to implement this and to know how can we better uh, work with this particle. So. Very uh, summarizing and take some take-home messages, nanoparticles, we can, let's say, say that they are suspended materials of nanometric side. They are multi-diverse regarding shape, origin, and types. Analytics and toxicology have to develop to better, to provide better legislation. And Wetsus and Stand and we, our group, we can both manufacture and characterize these particles in water. Well, thank you very much. Well, Leuton, thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, which gave us a nice overview about what we can find in water nanometric sizes and how difficult it is to actually characterize and see it. And I look at Herman asking if there are any questions. There is. It, it's a very general question, but um, the question is about the plastic nanoparticles, what the health effect is to animals and humans as these uh, particles enter the food chain. Uh, yeah. I think this is a highly debated um, yeah. uh, area, but maybe can you say something general? Yeah. About what is known or what direction we should be thinking about? Yeah, well, um, it's not really uh, a field that, that we are busy with, the toxicology aspect, as I said, but there are many groups working on that. And one of the main aspects is the deposition. So what we have, what we know so far is that these particles can be found in many different organisms, uh, even in very small ones like uh, mussels, but they have been also found in, in uh, lungs tissues and brain tissues. And the question of how toxic they are depends on the, the uh, size itself, the accumulation of the material itself, but also depends on the type of chemicals that they can release in very simple terms. Uh, for example, in the plastic, uh, from the plastic itself, you can have substances uh, like phthalates or other substances that will originate from the presence of the material and will become and will uh, bring toxic as toxic aspects to the water. So, to which extent uh, in concentration language, uh, it's still. Uh, in many different areas, difficult to say due to the multitude of materials that you can find. Are there natural polymer particles or are all of these polymeric particles plastics that are man-made in well, origin? Yeah, we you have mainly uh, man-made particles, man -made, man -made okay. particles, but of course there are also, uh, we have indeed a, a, ver a field by itself on the construction of this, let's say, uh, biodegradable plastics, mm. which tends to be a, a trend to avoid these toxic aspects. Yeah. Excellent. We would have time for one last question, if there is a question. Oh, I think the we've audience. answered these, yeah. Okay, well in that case, Luton, thank you again very much for your presentation. And now from the general overview of nanoparticles, let's go back and focus a little bit again on calcium carbonate and also on the possibilities of magnetic water treatment as initially also announced by Professor Gebauer. And for that, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Thales Rai. She is a PhD student at Wetsus and she will tell us about how magnetic water treatment can be demystified using yeah, all the latest knowledge in the field that is available. Tali, the floor is yours. Thank you so much um, for having me today and also good afternoon to the audiences. 
so my presentation is uh, mainly about the controversial uh, topic of magnetic water uh, treatment uh, that uh, fortunately demystified recently. Uh, so uh, what was the um, controversy regarding the magnetic water uh, treatment? Um, the researchers uh, were claiming there, there were some, uh, some uh, claims about the effect of the magnetic devices um, on water, but there were uh, there were no uh, sufficient uh, models to explain all the aspects uh, of the effect. Actually, uh, so that was the uh, thing that uh, was uh, mainly um, actually uh, controversial in the scientific community. Uh, because the models were ba basically uh, focused on the absolute uh, field experience of the devices um, and uh, they were not successful to fulfill all the, the explanations of the, um, the effect of the magnetic field. Um, until finally on uh, 2012, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Koi, uh, the pro uh, former uh, professor of uh, Trinity College, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is about the, the contra controversy topic of the um, magnetic field. And this part is about the uh, Professor Koi, that uh, he was a former um, a professor of the um, physics faculty of Trinity College in Ireland. He was uh, successfully published uh, 700, more than 700 scientific reports um, uh, regarding the diverse aspects of magnetism. Uh, so on uh, 2012, he could actually discover uh, a very important uh, role uh, uh, of the, the pre-nucleation clusters that is actually the main, uh, the main role that is uh, influenced by the magnetic field in water. Um, so what was the hypothesis of uh, COIS? Uh, if we consider a, a chain of the uh, calcium carbonates, uh, as you can see, the, the, the green one is represents the uh, calcium ions and the, the other ion, uh, ion pair is the uh, carbonate surrounded by uh, water molecules. Uh, if we consider them as a polar uh, object in the water that is uh, moving with uh, velocity V um, uh, in the presence of the uh, changing um, magnetic field, then uh, uh, we can say that um, that um, in the presence of the magnetic field uh, gradient, actually um, the proton uh, of the bicarbonate ions are defaced uh, so that it will facilitate and accelerate, accelerate the bounding of calcium ions uh, into the chain of the carbonate ions and in actually the, the growing the um, dollops uh, clusters. Um, so, based on the Koi's hypo hypothesis, uh, we have a Koi, he, he was successfully actually developed a parameter named as a Koi um, criterion. It is a function of um, the, the length of the um, magnetic device uh, that is used for the magnetic treatment and also the velocity of the dollops um, and uh, the larmer uh, frequency. Uh, with the uh, presence of the gradient of the magnetic field. And he proposed that if this parameter is uh, more or equal than one, then uh, we will have the ideal conditions for having the, um, having the uh, actually magnetic field affected. Um, um, yeah, um, um, ideal magnetic field effect on the pre-nucleation clusters. Uh, so, this hypothesis was uh, studied um, and published in uh, 2016. Um, uh, this is a, a sample of a magnetic field mapping uh, of a, a regular a cylindrical um, a magnet bar. As you can see uh, that it is uh, uh, represented by our RGB as uh, in three di uh, dimensions, X, Y, and Z. But uh, the... Um, the important one was the uh, mag uh, actually the absolute magnitude of the um, magnetic field in these three uh, dimensions and the composition of that, uh, which is shown in the picture. Uh, so.
This was the water core magnet that, uh, that was used in order to study the uh, COIS uh, theory. And uh, because uh, it, mm, this device was, ide uh, was ideal to use uh, for this study because it has um, uh, the very low uh, flux uh, density, almost close to the um, natural magnetic field of Earth. Uh, so as you can see, the, also the gradients is calculated based on the uh, same um, method that uh, in the previous slide. Um, so uh, if we actually calculate the COIS criterion based on the water core magnets uh, characterizations and parameters, then we reach to the uh, number eight uh, for the C parameter, which is uh, more than one and actually fulfilled the uh, um, conditions for a successful uh, treatment. And here are the results uh, for this one. And we have two actually uh, results that can be um, used in order to explain actually the evidence of the presence of the uh, dollops in water. And also uh, we have the um, direct measurements of dollops um, using the laser scattering and FFF moles. Uh, so one of the um, uh, methods that were used uh, was uh, electrical uh, impedance spectroscopy. Uh, so we expect to see that uh, with growing, um, uh, growing the dollops and um, uh, having the less uh, concentration of free ions in the solution, then we expect to have the higher impedance. Uh, that was also in agreement with the results of the, the, the impedance uh, change um, for a blank and a treated uh, water with the water core magnet, which can be actually best explained uh, by the uh, Dollops theory. Also, uh, we have um, the changes in microbiome uh, in, um, uh, in the samples that were, they were treated with water core magnet after uh, six days. It, it, this one is also can be explained uh, very well with the uh, presence of the dollops in uh, water and the um, lower concentration of uh, uh, calcium ions. Um, we have also direct uh, measurements of the uh, of dollops in uh, water with the laser ex um, scattering uh, again uh, with the blank and treated uh, sample after two days and uh, also after six days that you can see um, after two days uh, it is not much significant but after uh, six days we have a significant difference between the um, a number of um, particles um, in the solution, which is represents, uh, which is representing the dollops actually in the um, solution. And um, here we have uh, the the FFF moles method that was used to uh, measuring um, directly dollops in water. Um, yeah, as you can see. Uh, from this video, um, yeah. Uh, so the, the the samples that is actually the sample of uh, containing dollops will be uh, injected into the uh, channel um, uh, of the uh, FFF moles, and uh, the sample will be mainly focused on the um, uh, on the bottom of the channel, which is uh, the membrane, and. Uh, um, we have the cross flow. Actually, we, uh, we have the cross flow that focuses the sample on the bottom of the channel, and uh, because of the Brownian motion, uh, the sample will be um, actually uh, react to the um, cross flow, and we have the diffusion. So the low, um, the smaller particles will uh, stay up upper um, in, uh, compared to the uh, larger particles. Um, at, this, at the time that we have an equilibrium between the cross flow and the diffusion, then we have the channel flow, which uh, actually uh, guide the particles through the channel. And after that, we have the particles uh, passing through the detectors. So the multi-angle uh, um, light scattering that is consisting of uh, 18 uh, the detectors, and they will um, actually measure the particles based on their size. 
so at the end we be, we will have um, the, se the separation of the size uh, by hydrodynamic sizes and uh, we will see them uh, through the, um, the light scattering signals and uh, we can analyze the signal and at the end we have the size distribution from them. So the first, the first one represents the smaller particles, the, the, the second peak represents the bigger par particles. Uh, so this is, this is uh, one of the results, typical results from the dollops. It, it was uh, actually a measure from the dollops um, from the undersaturated region of the pre-nucleation clusters at pH 9. As you can see, the size distribution is uh, mainly um, um, between um, 20 or 30 nanometer in radius um, uh, till um, 120 or 30. Uh, that is uh, actually in agreement with the, the theory. And um, there's some uh, messages uh, to take home. Uh, first of all, uh, Naturally occurring calcium carbonate nanoclusters or dollops are the key actually to understand the magnetic water um, treatment. And the, the effectivity of magnetic treatment de uh, depends on the um, depends on the uh, inhomogeneity of the field, not um, on the um, strength of the field. And effective ma magnetic treatment actually accelerates the growth of uh, dollops. Thank you so much for uh, your attention. Well, Tali, thank you very much for your interesting presentation on uh, magnetic treatment and preliminary results on the th testing the hypothesis of Professor Coey. I'm looking at Herman again. Do we have questions from the yes, audience? Yes, we do. I, I think this one is a bit much. Um, uh, I don't think we're quite at that stage yet. But the question is, does Coey's formula quantitatively explain the highly irreprodu irreproducible nature of the results reported for magnetic treatment in practice? So I don't think we have a complete answer on this yet. But do you want to take a stab at it? Uh... Um. <laughs> I, I can nice say. Question, yeah. I, I can also say something about that. Yeah, please. Yeah, the, the problem with uh, magnetic treatment and the scientific literature is that in most of the papers, uh, Coe theory is not used. But most of the papers, as Tali showed, use uh, the Lorentz force as explanation. And in most cases, this force is just not big enough to explain the results. And the point is, if now one group does a magnetic treatment with magnet A of a certain field strength and uses the Lorentz force, and group B tries to repeat that, buying a magnet of the same strength, but probably with a different gradient, with different gradients. Now, if Coe's theory is true, group B will not be able to reproduce what group A has done because the gradients are different. So one group says, yes, we have treated our water and yes, we have results. And group B says, well, we have reproduced your experiments with a magnet of the same strength and it does not work. So it's all nonsense. So the problem is the choosing of the right parameter. And uh, there's not so much literature on magnetic treatment with the same gradients. There's a lot literature using the same field strength. And I think this is the problem that's key to the uh, differences and inhomogeneity, if you will, of the different uh, results that you get with magnetic water treatment. Thank you. One more. Um, magnetic water treatment can induce formation of dollops. Can it also reverse it? Um. Based on the literature and based on our information so far, uh, we, we have not enough knowledge on the formation of the uh, dollops based on the, the influence of the magnetic field. But as far as we know, uh, or at least I can say as far as I know, no, it cannot. Excellent. Um, there's one more. I, uh... It says you're picking up by mulse. The, the particles that you're picking up by mulse are very large. Um, would you really call them pre-nucleation clusters? So I think the, the picture that you showed showed both large and smaller particles, but indeed we're, we're on the, say, 20 nanometer regime or something. And the main population was below 60 nanometer. 
Um, uh, so they, they were actually collected in the pre-nucleation um, stage. Uh, based on the uh, pre-nucleation um, process, it was calculated very precisely. So it was carefully collected from the pre-nucleation cluster. And the main population is uh, below 60 nanometers. So yeah, it, it, it can be considered. So yes, they are yes. pre-nucleation. Yes, excellent. That's the questions that I have here. Yes, and the time is up. Uh, thank you again very much, Tali, for your very interesting presentation. And now, from the academic approach that we have seen so far on the topic of nanoparticles and water, I'm very happy to welcome a Senior Advisor of Water Treatment, Stefan van der Wetering from Brabant Water here. And uh, he will address the possibility of using and applying this knowledge in a practical side. Stefan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alma. Um, then my title is, do dollars play a role in groundwater purification? Interesting question, but very hard to answer. But um, I selected uh, two studies, um, very close related to the lime carbonic acid equilibrium. Uh, also the working field of the dollop. Um, and both uh, studies, we solved the problem, but fundamentally we don't understand exactly what really happened. So I want to present those two uh, studies, one in Eindhoven, uh, recent, and one from Friedman Band uh, Lieshout, and that's a very, a very old study, but we still have a lot of questions about that. First of all, I work at the, at the water company. Um, here's here an overview of the water companies in the Netherlands. There are only 10 left in the Netherlands, and I work at the water company in the south called Brabant Water. Um, a short introduction, Brabant Water um, uh, only has groundwater as the main source, um, um, and we produce um, the drinking water with 30 uh, treatment plants. The first study I want to present is um, the study in Eindhoven. In Eindhoven, we're going to build a new treatment. And um, based on the groundwater content, we selected this uh, setup, uh, treatment setup, um, that must be sufficient to produce drinking water with it. Because we have proven it already at a lot of treatment plants around Eindhoven. But what did we saw? Um, we saw that when we start treating um, water with a low conductivity, water with a low conductivity, we see um, that in the end, we have drinking water with a high turbidity. And turbidity, you have to see it, there's a lot of iron particles. When we switch off to uh, water, drinking water with a high, with a high conductivity, then we see the treatment works. Then we see a very low, uh, con uh, very low turbidity. So what, what's the difference between high conductivity and low conductivity related to the quality of the treatment. So we looked at the groundwater boreholes in Eindhoven and we here you see an overview of all the boreholes and as you see we extract from different depths. But what we also saw, there is um, a great variation in, in uh, water quality of each well. And you see the difference here in the conductivity. And the conductivity uh, difference is caused by the, the, the difference in calcium and the difference in bicarbonate. So is there a relation between calcium bicarbonate and the filterability of iron particles in this setup and groundwater treatment. 
So we start doing uh, some experiments and we start dosing calcium to the lower conductivity waters. And we dose that, that amount of calcium to the raw water, anaerobic. And here you see, when we start dosing, you see the orange line, the conductivity rising because of the dosing of the calcium. We see lowering of the turbidity. If we increase the amount of calcium, we see a more decrease of the conductivity. If we stop dosing calcium, you see directly an increase of the turbidity. And turbidity means iron particles. So that's interesting. Dosing calcium, improving the filtrability of iron particles. So it's, is it only calcium? Uh, yes, th th that works out, but we also dosed magnesium and it has the same effect as calcium. Um, but we thought, what will happen when we dose bicarbonate? So we start doing a test by dosing bicarbonate to the raw water. And exactly the same as happened with the calcium, you see when we start dosing the bicarbonate, you see a decrease of the turbidity. If we increase the amount of bicarbonate, you see more decrease of the turbidity. When we stop dosing bicarbonate, directly rising the turbidity. Um, but, we have to make a final treatment scheme for Eindhoven. And um, uh, we are not used to dosing calcium chloride or baking powder. Um, that's not common. We are used to dosing um, sodium hydroxide. And we saw when we dose sodium hydroxide at the raw water, then you get a, re uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, sodium hydroxide, then you get a reaction with carbon dioxide and then you make bicarbonate. And even dosing only 11 milligrams of sodium hydroxide, we see the same results uh, as dosing bicarbonate, uh, as dosing calcium chloride or baking powder. So uh, the conclusion is that if you influencing the lime carbonic acid equilibrium by dosing, um, we improve the, filter, the filterability of iron. Very unique. We never saw that in any treatment. We have a lot of experience. And we could ask ourselves the question, do dollop play a role in this process? I don't know. The next study is Lieshout. And that's a treatment plant like this. We have a double rapid sand filtration, um, just a classic one. Um, and here you see the water quality uh, of Lieshout. And you see the pH is calcium is rather hot water, two and a half millimol. And we see the theoretical amount of calcium carbonate form, forming, and that's based on the, the equilibrium. Uh, you could see that a theoretical an amount of calcium should nucleate uh, at 10 degrees but you have always natural inhibitors in the water, so it doesn't occur at room temperature. If you boil the water, of course, then you get lime nucleation and calcium carbonate forming. But in Lieshout, very a phenomenon occurs, even at room temperature, you get spontaneous lime nucleation. We never saw that before, but there it happens. And if you look at Lieshout versus Vechel, and Vechel is a treatment in the area around, and you see they have almost the same composition chemical. And um, the only difference is that you get is the amount of organic carbon. In Lieshout, you have a low organic carbon, and in Vechel, you have a higher amount of organic carbon. And spontaneous nucleation doesn't occur in Vechel. 
So we saw a relation between organic matter and nucleation of lime. What did we do to solve the problem in Lieshout? Because the customers has a lot of problems with, with the lime nucleation at the tap. Um, we blend the water from Lieshout from, with an other treatment plant. And what we do then, we dose an amount of organic matter. And uh, that decreases the amount of calcium carbonate forming, but it also, what's very important, um, the spontaneous nucleation and these out stopped at room temperature. Um, we also did some experiments in Vechel because if you remove organic matter in the water of Vechel, do, you, do we get then spontaneous nucleation? But the answer was no. It didn't occur. So uh, it's not always that the more organic matter, the lower the amount of calcium carbonate forming at temperature is not true at all. That is not true completely. Uh, it's more, I think, the nature and the amount of organic matters that matters. And also here, the question, do dollops play a role? Um, yeah, conclusion and outlook. You see that um, with magnesium, calcium, bicarbonate, organic matter, they play a very important role in groundwater treatment. The filtrability of iron removal, that's the base of all our treatments, is iron removal. And it also has some impact on lime nucleation. What, what we need, what we want, is more study to the lime carbonic equilibrium, of course, but also dollops. It should be studied further to gain more mechanical insights. And with that, there, there's possibly we get alternative technology of the right insights to help us, our sector, to improve the groundwater treatments, to improve the drinking water quality, but also the customer satisfaction. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Stefan, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, as you know, what you want is exactly what we try to do to our best uh, in the applied water physics at Wetzers to investigate the dollops uh, formation and how to control it properly so that you have, might get alternative methods, sustainable methods to control spontaneous nucleation, to prevent it or even to force it, depending on your application. Now I'm looking at Hermann. Yes, I have a question, but it's it's a it's a far question far removed from from Lieshout or Vechel. The question is about the the water in the Sinai, which is very high on fluoride. And fluoride. The yeah. question is, uh, I, I guess so. Did the, the here you talked about removal or, or clustering of of iron when you dose uh, calcium. The question is, if you have any advice for removing fluoride, would that also be related to the calcium or the organic matter? Do you think? Um, I don't know. That's 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 very hard. Chemically, you can remove fluoride, of course, but I don't know if there is any relation uh, with the lime uh, acid equilibrium. No, unfortunately. Yes, no. One more about when you bring up groundwater to the surface, you may enhance degassing and also precipitate uh, calcium carbonate. Um, just like in caves, could this play a role in Lieshout? What's the pressure difference in Lieshout? I guess it's the same as in Vechel. Yes, it's 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 the same. But uh, if we do degassing, you rise the pH. Yeah, and uh, that's of course occurs, and that's uh, then you. But still, at uh, that temperature and at that pH, spontaneous uh, lime nucleation doesn't occur. Should not occur. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so that's why we, um, we normally we don't see that. Yeah. So we don't, we don't think it plays a role, but it's not that there's another question that says, are you able to give more details on the nature of the organic matter in the different drinking waters? I guess this is also yeah. still heavily under, under this is investigation. Yeah. It's extremely interesting also for us.
Yes, but we do a lot of research about uh, getting more uh, the uh, do research to the the content of the organic matter. Yeah, we have to split it in small parts, and which is responsible for what. Yeah, and um, yeah, th there are studies going on, and of new technologies occur at laboratory, mm. but but still, um, it's still Marco. Yeah, what we how we can slice the, the organic matters, but. Um, a lot of research is going on on that topic. Yeah. So we hope to be able to answer this question in more detail later on. But at this moment, it's still uh, very much calls for research. Exactly. And this is what we are doing and what we will continue to do, including uh, Brabant Water. Well, thank you very much, Stefan, for your interesting presentation from the applied side. And we will stay on the applied side with our next presentation by uh, Johannes Laag from the Austrian company IPF. He is the head of research of this company. And he will tell us also about uh, dollops in the, what dollops mean for the applied world of uh, his, uh, the, the kind of water treatment that he is doing. Johannes, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elmar, for your invitation. I'm sitting here in Austria, in the near of the Walchsee, in the company IPF. Uh, we are producing and the manufacturer of the Granda products. The Granda products are a sort of chemical-free uh, water treatment. And Dali said a lot about the theory, and Professor Gebauer also behind the, the dollops, and the dollop formation. And we are very sure that the dollops are for our technology are very decisive for the, for the effects. We have recognized more than 30 years. Our products are more than 30 years on the market. And in this uh, slice, you see the, the Granda devices in the domestic applications. And on the left side, you see exactly the same product, which was um, researched in the, in the dollop paper, the water core magnet. Uh, there are different shapes of the water core magnets. One shape is this cylindrical uh, part, but we have also inline units to build in, in inline in the house. So the applications are very, Various. You can applicate it in swimming pools. You can do it in heating systems. You can do it in your pipe work in the drinking water system. And there are many different effects. And many years we had no idea what is the what is the background of these effects. And till we have this new paper, and till we have the contact to Elma and contact to Wetsus know a lot more and we think the dollops give a, a very big contribution to all these effects we can see so i want to give you some examples we have recognized in this long time of these 30 years um, normally when you deal with water in pipework system you always have main questions and one of the main question is what about the lime scale deposits in your pipework the second question is, what about the stability? What about the hygienic condition in your bike systems? What about the biofilms in your systems? And the third, what about the corrosion in your bike work systems? And we think, and we are very sure, that dollops play a very important role in all of these questions. And we are not sure we, when we recognize this, this grander effects, these very beneficial effects, uh, we, we were not sure what, what is the real effect, what is the background of all of that. And now we see, yes, the dollops play a very important role, but we suggest there is also a quantum effect. There are also other effects which play a role in, in all of these effects. 
And for us, it seems that water has electrical properties. This sounds a little bit, yeah, we don't know what, what are electrical properties in the water. But when we see the dollar formation, we, we saw also uh, different effects. When you go to the, to the system of the corrosion, we have many effects seen in, in heating systems. And here on this slide, on this picture, you see a heating system before we treated it and after the treatment. And the, the, the rust goes down after the treatment, after uh, three months of treatment, uh, nearly to zero. And this was very impressive to us. And I said, yes, we suggest that water has electrical properties. We think that because you know, each kind of corrosion process is always a kind of uh, electrical charges in the water and the, the stuff. And so when we can, or when the dollops can influence these electrical charges in the water, we can also change or yeah, have different processes with these corrosion things. The other thing is the crystal formation. Each type of limestone formation, each time of a precipitation scale formation is always a type of crystal formation. And we think the dollops have also their big influence on that. And you know that dollops are nanoparticles consisting of the same material as the, as the calcium carbonate crystals. Here, for example, I have the aragonite. And we are very sure that the influence is in this way I have done it on, on this picture. Normally, and you know it, if you are a, a consumer of water and, and, you, and you have water pipes in your house, when you have a water with a high total hardness, sometimes there's a big problem because the, uh, the calcium carbonate begins to crystallize on the walls and the, the water pipe becomes more clogged and clogged and clogged until the flow is not running through the, through the pipe. When you have, now then there's the big difference, when you have a lot of dollops, and we saw when we do the treatment with Granda, we get more dollops in the water flow. And we say when you have more water, uh, more dollops in the water flow, the crystallization does not start on the walls. The crystallization starts in the water flow. So that means these crystals, which normally goes on the walls and clog your pipe, can spill out with the water flow. And this is a, a very big benefit uh, for the users uh, in the practice. And another thing, where we think that the dollops are, have a, a big effect is the flocculation. Flocculation is a process which is used in many different applications. One application you use, you know very good. These are the swimming pools. When you have a lot of dirt in your swimming pool, you can do some flocculants in the swimming pool and the flocks uh, becomes bigger and bigger and then you can filter out it. And this is one of the effects which we recognized also all over these many years, all over these 30 years. And we think the dollop formation or the dollops can also influence the flocculation. And when you can improve your flocculation, you have a big benefit because your filtration system works a lot better than without this flocculation. And I think these are the most important things. And I want also to summarize these things. We think dollop formation and the dollop has big influence for all processes of corrosion because these electrical properties of the water uh, have a big influence on corrosion processes. The second is the crystallization and the crystallization is exactly that what we understand under the term of um, the dollop formation uh, influencing the, uh, the 
calcium carbonate precipitation on the pipe walls. The third is the flocculation. One of these effects of the flocculation is going on in swimming pools, but also in other parts where you want to clean the water. And the last part, and I think there is some research going on at Wetzus, is the influence on microorganisms. You know, microorganisms also depending on the bioavailability of calcium and calcium carbonate. And when we, when we can change this equilibrium or we can shift this equilibrium of the calcium carbonate in these microorganism systems, I think we also see differences in the formation of, uh, of the bacteria. So thank you, this was my presentation and we can come we can come to the questions. Well, Johannes, thank you very much for your presentation, which actually nicely shows that the theories and the scientific results that we are currently producing with the help of uh, sponsoring companies and, of course, the researchers doing the work are already explaining effects that have been known for quite some time but not understood. So the dollop research itself, nanoparticles in water research itself, is already in the applied field, but it's not very well understood, apparently. And yeah, we will do our best to shed more light on that, to understand it properly. And I'm looking at my... I have a again. question, but it, it, it seems a little bit left field. Um, so the, the, the question is, there's a lot of, in, in a lot of places in the world, there's arsenic in the water and uh, causing blindness. And then the question is, do dollops play a role in the treatment of water for arsenic? Now, I'm not sure if you in, at Grander do anything about arsenic in the water. Have you ever looked at this? Um, I don't know that, but I, I can imagine, but I'm not sure. We haven't investigated that, but it would be a very interesting area. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think um, it's something that, uh, as there is a cross with all these other ions, it could be, but um, something to be researched. Another question is, how do you measure the concentration of dollops? Uh, maybe this is question more related to, to the tally. work of Tali. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I guess the, the field flow fractionation and the, the ICP, right? Um. Yeah, we can have all, uh, we, ha we can have the concentration of uh, dollops uh, both from the when we actually um, approach dollops from the uh, from the laboratory. So we artificially create dollops in the uh, in the lab. So we can have the information of the parameters of dollops in the um, solution that we make. Uh, that it can be up to fifty percent of the concentration of calcium ions in the. Uh, solution, but uh, if we consider natural samples like tap water, uh, if we have not yet uh, reached to that point to calculate the concentration of dollops in natural samples, uh, uh, but uh, uh, maybe based on the uh, size distribution um, and the fact that the um, size distribution can be a representative of the um, in some aspect can be a re representative of the number of the uh, particles uh, in the solution, then we can reach to the uh, concentration of the dollops. Okay. One more question that is more towards um, uh, Grander is, um, do you have experience uh, of the effect of your system on the struvite and map formation? What is struvite? Struvite, it's, it's one of the, the um, uh, uh, crystal formations of calcium carbonate. So have you, uh, oh, okay. do you have I any uh, uh, experience, I guess, on whether your system changes the, the different types of calcium carbonate that come out? Uh, uh, we saw in the, in the, in the practice that when we apply grinder in, the, in practice, uh, we saw that the, the calcium formation, the calcium carbonate formations, are have another, have another type of crystallization. 
but we are not sure is it aragonite, is it calcite or fatorite. Um, we haven't researched this, but the, yeah, our employees said always, yes, there is a big difference, but we haven't measured it. But I think it can be, yes. And one more question is, can you separate different nanoparticles like gold, silver, and copper from wastewater with your approach? So does the magnetic field do something to the presence of uh, gold, silver, and copper? <laughs> oh, this is a very delicious, but I can't answer it. Sorry. No, no. I don't know. Sorry. And we haven't looked into that at Wetsus either. So. No. no. Yes. <laughs> Okay. We have a lot of other particles to do first, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking at the time, yeah. and uh, I think I uh, well, would like to thank Johannes uh, very much again for his uh, presentation about the application of water core magnets in connection with dollop formation and the X. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I would ask our uh, last speaker, uh, George Huber, CEO of IPF, who is sitting next to Johannes, also in Austria, to tell us why he thinks that dollop research may have a big scientific impact in general. You have, um, George? Yes, I, or is yours? Uh, I, I even uh, said it more provocative. Uh, uh, maybe the dollop uh, research may win the Nobel Prize. And uh, I have a background story for that because I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm the CEO, uh, but I was very much involved in the research about the things we saw. And so my story begins with uh, the former president of Israel, president of Israeli Physical Society Professor Eshel Ben Jacob, or Ben Jacob in English, uh, who unfortunately died uh, on the 5th June of two, uh, 2015. Uh, uh, we met Eshel in 2002 in Sigtuna in Sweden. Uh, and uh, you see Eshel on the left side, me in the background and the right side, uh, Johannes. And uh, Eshel was not very happy on these days. He had been invited by the Nobel Prize Committee to present his findings about changes in the structure of water. And all members of the Nobel Prize Committee were very impressed by his results, but he was refused uh, to be a candidate for the Nobel Prize because his measuring device was not a physical apparatus, but billions of bacteria, an optical picture. Uh, what did I should do? Uh, you see on the left side, he took water, uh, and uh, he took the nutrient medium, he mixed it, a special proce uh, procedure, and then he inoculated this uh, with bacteria. And you see the result down there, it uh, took a certain time and uh, always the same procedure and whatever. Uh, now on the right side, this was the control. Now on the right side, you see the different influence the water with radio frequency. He again took the nutrient medium, he mixed it, he inoculated, and I think everyone can see the result is very different. Bacteria grow in a different patterns, different speeds, and even different chirality. Um, I have to add, uh, if you uh, do the procedure of the inoculation after three hours, around three hours, the uh, result on the right side does not appear. This is an indication that it's not a chemical reaction staying, uh, but it seems to be a physical effect. 
So uh, it's one experiment and three proofs. Water reacts to EM radiation, electromagnetic radiation. Water stores information, and information influences microbiology. Uh, the word information, as I used it in this example, is a signal that or change that can be detected and interpreted by a biological system and it causes a reaction. Um, so that was some of the questions we had and we discussed also with him, can water store information, how and where does it work, uh, what are the consequences of this? Uh, at that time, that was the year 2002, Eschel was working for an American company producing so-called nanodotted water. Uh, this means adding nanoparticles to water to stabilize certain processes in combination with this water. It had to do with uh, pharmaceutical companies. There was a lot of money involved. Uh, and uh, he had signed, he had to sign a so-called non-disclosure agreement, and he was not allowed to work for another company in that field for a number of years, it was 10 years. So, uh, but uh, I heard from Ashton and I know, uh, he did a lot of, of research also on different types of natural water, uh, just to have an overview uh, what is the difference natural water, RO water, and he also uh, uh, did research on so-called holy springs of the Indians. He had an access to excellent measuring devices at that time, and he found so-called nanoparticles in 2002, later defined it as dollops, and nanobubbles. Uh, these are gaseous bubbles in nano size. He also found out that uh, so-called bottled spring water sold by Cola and Nestle, RO, this is RO water with some minerals added later, never contained any nanoparticles. Uh, Eschel was convinced, uh, now you can ask me why do you know this, uh, Eschel and I became good friends and he later on called me very often uh, on the internet, sometimes we discussed uh, even a night long, and so I know he was convinced based on his practical and well-funded research on his nanoparticles. Uh, and this research was lasting over years. He was convinced that the form, formation of his nanoparticles, dollops, somehow was influenced by the same forces that caused his changes in bacterial growth. He was convinced that these nanoparticles would give him the, cha uh, the chance, so the nanoparticles are the dollops, would give him the chance to prove his findings. Uh, and he already had presented to the Nobel Prize Committee. And he was convinced he could achieve the Nobel Prize by using the nanoparticles. So I have two pictures. Uh, one is uh, Hans Granda, the inventor of the Granda uh, units. And Eshel Ben Jakob, he was visiting us several times because he had certain findings and he was very interested. And uh, on the other side, we see uh, pictures of the nanoparticles in a presentation in Vermont. Uh, Eshel once also was a, a speaker at Vetsus. Uh, the other thing is uh, dollop pictures uh, 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 made by Ashland at the very, uh, very early, maybe 2003 or 2004, whatever it is. 
Uh, so you saw us, he also tried to improve uh, the optical uh, presentation. Uh, so I say, if Eschel was right, and the Nobel Prize Committee doesn't change its opinion, the dollar per search of the team applied daughter uh, physics is somehow hovering over around the Nobel Prize. Because it may show effects or behavior of water not known or not described uh, before. These effects seem to be used by biology or life since the beginning of life. So uh, I'm a businessman and I have to um, think about goals, to, to define goals, and I have always think and decide about chances. What I think is the goal is excellent and the chances are all are also excellent. So I hope that uh, what Eschel has started a long time ago on a different way, may be completed by the Wetzel's team and bring the Nobel Prize for Wetzel's and for the team applied water physics. So that's some thoughts of a businessman. Maybe you will agree. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your uh, high hopes and trust in our research. This is really highly appreciated. And thank you also for your excellent presentation. I also knew Professor Eschelben uh, Jacob. It was, he was a very, very interesting personality. It's a pity that he died so early. Anyhow, uh, other questions from the audience? I, I do have a question. Um, it's a bit down to earth before we start handing out the Nobel Prize. <laughs> um, the question is whether the, the, um, the, whether Grander has ever looked at the effect of their treatment on electrolysis. So if you, if you go from the assumption that the, um, the Grander influences the electrical properties, then you might think that there's an effect on the electrolysis of water. Um, and the question is, has, has there been any research in this direction? No, I don't no. think so, no, no. Something for future research. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> That's all I have here. Well, um, I think we've had a beautiful... I think so too, so we... Round all the way from the highly applied to the, uh, to the uh, sorry, the highly fundamental to the, to the applied. Think so um, a large range of subjects, many questions. Maybe we end up with more questions than we started with, but also I think with directions of things that are crystallizing in yeah. terms of thinking about this. I think we have had a nice um, mixture of uh, theories that still need to be proven, very applied research that has no explanation. Uh, problems that have not been solved yet, although they seem to be basic standard wet chemistry. So that apparently that wet chemistry, I think this is one of the main things we learned today, wet chemistry is not as simple as we were taught it to mm. be. And yeah, with that, I would like to thank my, uh, all the guests here and my uh, co-host again, and especially all the speakers and also everybody in the audience for their uh, attention. Thank you very much for your interest in natural nanoparticles in water. And uh, whereas I'm not so sure whether we can meet the expectations of George Huber, I am very positive that the research on nanoparticles in water will produce one or more highlights in the coming future. So thank you all very much for your uh, attention and thank you everybody on your screens watching from all over the world. Thank you very much.